So those are the two goals for today. So framed another way, these are fraternal twins, right? Two sperm, two eggs, but born, fertilized at the same time. Boy and a girl. So this is some of the first evidence, you know, long ago, not this picture, that human sex determination didn't have a huge environmental component. That is, how could you possibly have two offspring that were different sexes growing at the same time in the same uterus from the same mother unless there was some sort of a genetic component? I'll put that in another way in a slide or two. The craziest thing I can tell you about, although there's a lot of crazy things about how sex works, including did anybody come to the talk on Wednesday? We learned a little bit about some of the crazy ways that organisms that are sexually reproducing function, weird genitalia and all sorts of other things. We'll learn a little bit about that too today. Sex is critical for many reasons. Right? <laughs> the number one thing that we heard about on Wednesday was that if you're a sexually reproducing species and you don't have sex, then you go extinct. Right? If you don't have your sexually reproducing species, if there are males and females, and if one generation you have none of one sex, if you're all female or if you're all male, then what happens? No mating, no kids, anywhere for your species, you go extinct. So you'd think, at least I would think, I hope you will agree with me, that the way that an organism, that a species dictates who is going to be which sex is really, really, really important because if you screw it up, you might run into this situation where you go extinct. You might expect that there's some mechanism by which every species figures out how to make half of the organisms one sex and the other half the other sex. So there's this sort of long-held expectation that most species have about a 50-50 sex ratio. Half girls, half guys. What about in the case of some reptiles where the eggs are temperature dependent? Okay, so we've got a question about temperature-dependent sex determination in reptiles, right? So there are some organisms that don't use genetics to determine sex. What's the issue there? So as we'll see today, the reason that genetic sex determination is useful is because, well, I controlled basically the sex of my kids because I either gave them an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. What does that mean about the sex ratio in humans? Dads should produce about half daughters, half sons. Right? It's, that, it's because we have Y chromosomes, and they only get passed to half, and we're diploid. Half of fertilized embryos get Y chromosomes and become sons. Half get X chromosomes and become daughters. Do we actually have a 50-50 sex ratio in humans? Does anybody know? More men born, but less survival. I actually thought it was the other. I think it's slightly, very slightly skewed to women. The last thing I heard was there like 50.3%. I mean, but when you think about the numbers on the scale of billions of people, even a very small percent change is a big change. But we're, it's basically 50-50. Very close to 50-50 in humans. Half the humans on the planet essentially are female and half are male. But what about reptiles? So reptiles don't use genetics to do sex determination. So really, I shouldn't be talking about this. Cover the microphone. But it's a great question. So reptiles and lots of other organisms, no mammals that I know of, use temperature to, to determine sex. So if you rear the eggs at a low temperature, then more of them are one sex or the other. It depends on the species you're looking at. If you rear them at a higher temperature, you get mostly the other sex. So high temperature females, for example, low temperature the embryos incubate, you get males. So aside from genetics, why should that concern us? Right. So we kind of have a built-in fail-safe mechanism. We've only got two chromosomes. We have a 50-50 sex ratio. Reptiles, lots of them, some amphibians too, and some fish, they depend on the temperature of the environment to 
to dictate sex ratio. Why is that bad in this century? Global warming. So what's going to happen to all these species that use environment, climate, temperature specifically, to dictate how many of one sex versus the other sex there are? Could be very bad mass extinction style problems with, because some organisms naturally use temperature to tell the organism's offspring what sex to become. So I hope you're starting to get the idea that this is a critical process, sex determination. It's really important for fitness for every organism to either be, let's see, don't take this personally, it's a very sensitive topic, to be either female or male from an evolutionary sense. Because if you're both sexes, or if you're neither sex, you probably won't be fertile, you probably won't have kids. So most geneticists and evolutionary biologists feel like sex determination is probably the most fundamental decision that you make, that your cells make, when you're developing. Because it controls things like your morphology, how you look, like peacock, peahen, how you act, like mating displays, how you behave, and your physiology, what hormones you produce, and so forth. So we've got a couple examples of male and female major physiological and phenotypic morphological differences between males and females in these species. So here's the contrast. This is a simple chart that shows a bunch of different groups of organisms. We're eutherians. That's us. We've got the marsupials. We've got monotremes. Anybody know a monotreme? There's only two. Yeah, platypus is one. The echidna is the other. Yep, so not very many monotremes. And then we've got other ones that you might be more familiar with. Snakes, lizards, birds, crocodiles, turtles, etc. So all that's plotted up here is how do those different groups of organisms figure out what sex to become? So we have on the key on the left here four different types of genetic sex determination. There's our type, XX, XY, where men are XY, females are XX. There's ZZ, ZW, which is basically the same thing except that happens in birds and some insects. So in XX, XY, it's the XY sex that's male. They're the ones that have the odd sex chromosome. In the ZZZW systems, it's females that are ZW. So females in those systems determine the sex of their offspring by which chromosome they pass on. And then there's the diamond, temperature-dependent sex determination. So if you look at this, it's kind of crazy that there are some groups, despite how critical it is to do sex determination well for organisms' survival, there are groups that have every different type of sex determination. Fish especially. You can find species of fish that do XX, XY sex determination, or closely related species that do ZZZW, and then some other closely related species that do temperature-dependent sex determination or pH-dependent sex determination, or Finding Nemo-style sex determination. Then your clownfish use, does anybody know how clownfish do sex determination? Right. Right. So clownfish use social sex determination. Somehow a population of clownfish assess who is who, who, how many of one sex there are. There's only one female, and everybody else is male. And if that breeding female, which is always the largest fish in the population, when she dies or disappears, the largest male changes sex and becomes the breeding female. So somehow, the fish are, are detecting how large each other are, and they can change sex during their life. Right? That's in fish, too. So fish 
and amphibians and turtles and lizards really seem like they don't give a shit about how they do sex determination. Just like, yeah, it's all good. Whereas we, the Eutherians, all mammals only do XY sex determination. So in our group of very disparate organisms, Eutheria, we've all decided we're going to stay with this approach. And some other groups have decided, eh, whatever, it doesn't matter. So this has been a really big genetic conundrum for a really long time. So geneticists want to figure out why is it that some of these groups of organisms really hang on to the form of, of sex determination, especially genetic sex determination, and other groups, it doesn't seem to matter? Questions or comments on this? Bless you. So there are many different types of sex determination. Only some of them have to do with genetics. We're here to talk about the genetic sex determiners. And we've talked, I think, in this class, faulty memory, about the difference between males and females. So what are the, if we recap, what are the two genetic differences between a boy and a girl? OK, so there's either, so sex determination in humans has to either be presence or absence of a Y. That's one genetic difference between the two sexes. What's the other one? How does the girl differ from the boy, or the boy from the girl, aside from presence or absence of a sex? Pardon? Uh, what kind of gametes? Ah, so how do we define who's a male and who's a female? I think this is also review. If you, what? It has sperm right. Or uh, small, small mobile or large. Right. So in summary, the way we classify biologically who's a male and who's a female is by the gametes they produce. Small mobile gametes equals sperm equals male. Large immobile gametes equals oocyte equals female. So the biologist defines sex based on your gametes. So the question here is, how does, how does the stem cell that produces your gametes know what sex it is? Which is kind of a weird thing to have to ask, but it's true. Somehow your body knows what sex you are. The cells that produce your gametes, they decide for you whether or not they're going to produce oocytes or sperm. So there's some signal that gets sent to those stem cells in the gonad that produce the sperm and the eggs. The other difference between males and females is the number of X chromosomes, right? So what we have to figure out for every species that does sex determination genetically is which of these two differences is the causal difference? Is sex determined by the number of X chromosomes you have, or is it determined by whether or not you have a Y chromosome? Because it could be either. Could be the number of X chromosomes. You've got two, you're a female, you've got one, you're a male, or it could be presence or absence of the Y. I'm not even gonna ask if you know how male or how humans do it, because I think we've taught that before. And if you get absolutely nothing else out of this at all, at the very least, which I know you're already there, if you ever go to this bathroom in Pike Place Market in Seattle, I want you to be able to figure out which bathroom to go into. And, actually, and this is a great talking point. Does anybody have any concerns about this? Sure. So what do you do if you've got two X chromosomes and a Y chromosome? Which exists. And we'll talk about that more next class. And I wonder if they have a little personal genotyping machine off there to the right, just so you can check before you go into the wrong bathroom. <laughs> OK, so I, 
I could easily skip past this. It's the history of the human study of sex determination. I'll spend one minute telling you about how the Greeks thought sex determination worked. So Parmenides said, oh, it must be the side of the womb. So if the fetus develops on the left side, it's going to be one sex. The right side is going to be another. And that sounds environmental sex determination, which we know humans don't have. And then contemporary Anaxagoras said, oh, it must have to do with which testis fertilizes, produces sperm that fertilizes offspring. Okay. And along came Aristotle and said, hey, wait a second. There's some guys that have been injured in battle, and they only have one testis left. And we can observe that they have kids of both sexes. So clearly, Anaxagoras, you're stupid. <laughs> so what would we have to do to address the point from Parmenides? Sex is determined by which side of the womb the fetus develops on. How would you do it? How would you do an experiment, or how would you figure out whether or not that was a relevant factor in sex determination? I don't blame the Greeks for not having thought of this because this situation probably didn't exist. It was probably there probably weren't as many. I suspect there probably weren't as many twins born back in the day. It might have been lethal always to have twins. I don't know, but if they had ever had twins, they would know that it's possible to have identical twins they are both the same sex, despite the fact that they would have developed in different uterine environments. So clearly, neither of those is true. And we know, of course, that we do genetic sex determination. But that's, that was sort of the start, the philosophy behind me, well, people starting to think, how do we do sex determination? And then along came the 20th century, and people actually could study how sexual animals like Drosophila, Cenorhabditis, and mice perform and become males or females. I'm going to have to stop using that mouse. It's sad. I'm going to have to start, <laughs> stop using that mouse one pretty soon because there's going to be no photos of mice humping track pads. It's not, does anybody even know what, that that was a mouse with a mouse? Do people have mice in? So that's why we're going to look at the three classical organisms, mammals, Drosophila, and Cenorhabditis, they were some of the first organisms that geneticists actually figured out how sex determination works. And the reason this is an interesting problem comes from, well, stems from some observations of organisms that are kind of wacky in the way that they do both sex determination and sex in general. Does anybody know about sex in seahorse? Yeah, the males are, so seahorses are one of a very rare set of organisms where the males are the ones that do the male parental care. So they have the embryos, the males are the ones that have the brood pouch. Female puts her eggs in his brood pouch, he internally fertilizes them, and then he aerates them, oxygenates them. And then this happens. No, it's not on repeat. Here, let me make it bigger. Sorry for that. Try again. So that's a male seahorse giving birth to his kids. And what's even crazier is that an analog to the hormone that causes human females to have contractions when they're giving birth is the same, it's an analog, not the exact same hormone, but it's a very similar hormone that induces this in male seahorses. Crazy. Right, so seahorses define typical definitions that we have probably as humans of sex. And that's why, as we discussed earlier, this concept of anisogamy is important for figuring out who's the male, who's the female. So in seahorses, the male is the one that makes the little mobile gametes, so that's how we know he's a male. That's how we define he's a male. Otherwise, you might assume that that male was a female. So it's all about the gametes. Let me 
questions at this point? So we have to figure out the big question then, the ultimate question is, as I said at the beginning, how does an organism decide what gametes to make? That is, to a biologist, sex determination. How does that single cell organism eventually, after cell division and cell division and cell division, figure out, am I going to make sperm or am I going to make eggs? Or both. Which is a thing that we'll talk about. So we'll start off with the easiest case, and we'll pick up next time on Cenorhabditis in mammals. Drosophila, about 1900s, early 1900s, microscopists could start looking at the chromosomes, and I think I mentioned this previously in class. Every time they saw a male Drosophila, they saw that he had a weird-shaped chromosome. So there's a strong correlation between the sex of an organism and what its chromosomes look like. And that was the, be the basis for the concept that our chromosomes might dictate our sex. And this is exactly the same situation as in humans, where females have two X chromosomes, and males have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. So Drosophila, that's true. Mammals, that's true. Here's the concept we'll end on. Because there are two different, two differences between males and females, the number of X chromosomes and the presence or absence of the Y, what would you have to do to figure out, if, you, if I presented you with a new organism we knew nothing about, all we knew is that there are some males and there are some females, and that they use XY sex determination. What would you do to decide whether or not it's the number of X's or the presence or absence of a Y chromosome that causes sex? What sort of experiment, what sort of treatment, how would you decide that? What sort of things genetically could we do to these organisms to try to figure it out? Make their gametes weird. Oh, make their gametes weird. Spoken like a true developmental biologist. Developmental biologists, of which I'm kind of one, are a breed of people who like to tinker with organisms and move things around and find mutants. So what sort of a gamete would you want to, what sort of gamete, what sort of organism would you want to produce that would help you decide is it the number of X's or is it the presence or absence of a Y? Okay, so the question then is if you have a triple X fly, for example, versus an XXY fly. And it's especially the XXY fly in this case. So what happens if the number of X chromosomes dictates sex? So if it's the number of X chromosomes that dictates sex, what's the sex of an XXY fly? It's got two X chromosomes like a female, so if it's number of X's, it should be female. If it's presence or absence of the Y, it should be right. And that's exactly what scientists did. They looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and eventually found a really, really, really rare mutant fly that was XXY. Now, what was its sex? It was female. So they use an XY sex determination system just like we do, except that in their XY system, it's the number of X chromosomes that count, literally, not the presence or absence of the Y chromosome. In Drosophila, the Y chromosome does absolutely nothing for sex determination. It just is there. It doesn't have anything to do with sex determination. So say you have an organism that only has one X. Right. So then the question is, what was the other mutant they discovered? And that was an XO fruit fly, a fruit fly that had one X chromosome and no anything else, no other X or no Y chromosome. What's its sex? If it's the number of X chromosomes that causes sex, if you've got one X, then you're male. So the XXX 
is either, I don't remember exactly, but yes, you're right. So it's either it doesn't develop or it's a sterile female. So it has some, it's female, but it has some other problems because it's got one extra copy of the X chromosome. I think they were sterile females. Yes, sir. Oh, goodness, don't even get me started about triploids. <laughs> it gets harder with the, num the additional number of chromosomes. And there's some fish that are polyploid that some people study sex determination. I'm in awe of the fact that they even decided to try to work on that in the first place. <coughs> Bless you. So since everybody's getting sick and sneezing, I think I better let you go have hopefully a restful weekend. See you back here on Monday for our last couple of classes.